Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to the first OD Talk of 2022. Uh, we're very excited to, to kick off this year's OD Talks with um, our guest, Joe uh, Wallace from Willis House Watson. I'll give Joe a second to introduce himself soon. Um, and just a bit of, a, of, a, of an intro of where we are and, and why we chose this topic. Um, I think something that's that's obviously happened that all of you would agree with is that employee experience has become a hot topic over the past year or two um, and that we um, that we have tried to to stay on top of that curve as an organization development consultancy and academy and being an academy um, we with uh, Willis Stiles Watson um, in 2020 already um, to create uh, what we call the Employee Engagement and Experience Certification. So it's been a, a quite a journey for us to, to um, incorporate what we believe OD practitioners, and the OD way of doing things is with the, with the Willis Towers Watson intellectual property, their research, their beautiful frameworks. Um, and, and in that way, we've, we've created the certification. And that has also caused us to to be more, more on top of what's going on with, with uh, in the EX world. And as you would have noticed on LinkedIn and everywhere, there are lots of um, short webinars, longer webinars happening. Um, and it's really has become the hot topic. So I'm very excited today that um, we get to talk about this topic again. Um, and especially because Willis Stiles Watson have kept on doing their research and um, Joe will share with us uh, today some research they've done since, uh, since the COVID pandemic started and the various lockdowns and what's happening with some predictions of what they see what's coming in the future. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Joe to just introduce himself. We're then going to just look at some um, definitions of what we think OD is, and then we're going to go into breakaways for some discussions and come back and look at some of the research that's been done. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for making yourself available. I should probably say that in the invitation, we said that Matt from Willis Stiles Watson will be joining us this morning, but there's been a bit of a calendar clash. Um, so Joe has very kindly on short notice, uh, on short notice, uh, agreed to, to be our guest speaker today. Thank you, Joe, and over to you. Thank you, uh, Lisa. It's a great introduction. And yeah, such an interesting topic. Um, maybe we'll start with, with a little introduction of myself. Um, so Joe Wallace from Willis Towers Watson. It's a bit of a mouthful as well. Um, but I am a senior consultant based in Dubai. Um, the topic of employee experience has sort of been my profession uh, for nearly 10 years now, um, and I moved around a number of consultancies uh, in my early career, including Hay Group, Corn Ferry, Towers Watson, as it was in London, before moving out into the Middle East and working on the wider SMEA uh, world, I guess let's call it. Um, the, the scope of work that, that I cover is mainly now employee experience and it is such a broad topic and we'll cover off the definition of that in our in our discussion um, but also projects around culture projects around aligning organizational strategy to that culture especially in that sort of startup environment and how do they move through the cultural steps in order to become a a bigger more uh, inclusive organization looking at things like employee value proposition, which we may, may cover today, and then some of the drivers indeed of, uh, of employee experience and some of the listening techniques of those as well. So you can see it's, it's a broad uh, uh, job description, I guess. Um, so I'm really, really glad, excited to be here, and we can share some of the, the data with you uh, today. So Lisa, if you'll, uh, if you'll allow me to share my screen, I think, shall I kick things off? Yeah, please do. You should be able to to share. Yeah. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Fantastic. Good. So, look, there are a couple of us on the call. Uh, maybe some housekeeping rules. <laughs> Do have a question um, please do feel free to put it in the chat um, we are going to do some form of a breakaway groups as well to to discuss these topics um, but but please let's make it interactive um, ask me any questions challenge me on, on anything that you see yourselves um, let's start then with uh, employee experience and you know it, it is such a, a common topic we're seeing um, we call it a, a great awakening of employee experience and and as Liesl said 
um, constantly we're hearing this, these, these words um, on LinkedIn, on, uh, you know, through our organizations, uh, what is EX? Um, well, the first thing is the priority of that is, you know, 92% are saying over the next three years, the employee experience is going to be uh, their key priority from a strategic perspective. Um, but, but let us maybe start off then, what exactly is it? Well, for us, the employee experience is essentially every touch point that an, that an employee has with an organization. And so if you think that journey is going to start even before they join you, in terms of how you're branded in the marketplace, in terms of how social media portrays you, in terms of how you're presented on Glassdoor, for example, that is the starting point of the employee experience. And it goes all the way through the employee journey, all the way to after the exit, and then your um, how you're perceived by those who have exited you in that same social media loop. And when we look at that employee experience, um, we cover it off we're really with four main buckets. And we'll start in the top left. Let's start with a purpose. Let's start with why an employee would be with us in our organization. Are they inspired by what we're trying to achieve as a company? Is it an inclusive environment? And is there an understanding at the employee level of exactly what we do and what we want to achieve? That purpose is uh, you know, a key driver, essentially, of employees' uh, motivation to work for you and stay with you. If we look at a startup environment, um, that's also why a lot of people take a lot less money and also double hat in their role in a startup because they believe in what the organization is trying to do. The key, of course, is maintaining that purpose as you grow into an SME and then obviously in a large organization and keep understanding where the employee fits in there. Key thing to measure. When we look at the work, of course, it's about the agility that you have in your role. It's about being innovative, excuse me. Um, and also, you know, that there's a lot to do with, with having a voice and being able to feedback on some of those tasks. So, you know, is my job organized? Is it efficient? But do I have the ability to feedback on that role and change my role based on my experience? If I'm customer facing, then do I have the ability to change that role to make a better product or a better service for my customers? Or is there a process which is quite structured and it doesn't allow me to move between those, those lines? Staying ahead of the market then feeds into that. Are we continually improving ourselves to, to push ahead and, and bring out uh, new products and services, either internal or external customers? Let's go bottom right, total rewards. Um, total rewards covers, yes, it covers pay covers remuneration and, and it covers all of those other benefits, but it also covers in our mind, your room for growth and personal development. How can I move up in the organization? If I don't have that vertical growth, do I have the ability to, to branch out sideways? Is there an ability to take on uh, different roles within the organization, champions, SMEs? You know, we, we know that there are some flat organizations that maybe have been structured for a long time and there's just no room to, to move up. What else are they offering me? More and more, of course, in light of COVID, that also comes into benefits and the recognition piece. So benefits now includes things like well-being and recognition, of course, is that, that daily reminder or the, you know, the, the awards of how well you're doing and the connection you have to the organization. People is, is all about the people around you. Do I trust the leadership? Uh, am I supported by my team? Do we have cross collaboration between departments? Do we have collaboration inside the department as well? So all of those four pillars for us form the employee experience. And so if you think about your journey through the organization, pretty much this sums up hopefully everything that uh, the you experience in a day-to-day -day perspective. So what I want to do then, I want to tell the story of the employee experience and give you kind of the journey as we saw it from all of the, the employee experience surveys that we ran throughout COVID uh, and all the way to now 2021 uh, into 22. So let's talk about that employee experience. And so what you're seeing now on the screen is that, that model that we have just presented to you. At the bottom, you see those four buckets on the verticals. And now what we're seeing is, you know, each level of the employee experience, the, the model shows you that in the excellence bucket, we start at the top, these are the things that high performing organizations do better than other organizations. Emphasis is where organizations start to break away. So it's about being inclusive, having a voice and having the capability to progress in your career. And the essentials down here on the bottom is everything an organization needs to do fundamentally 
in order to function essentially as an organization. So if we look at it as the basics to, to work and, and be organized, how we start to break away as a high performing organization, and then how we really excel as a high performing organization. And this is based on research. The outcomes of those two are, of course, engagement, traditional engagement, which is, you know, your pride and your connection to the organization. And then obviously the other side of that, which is your, your intention to stay, your retention piece. Do I want to continue working here? And we see those as different uh, outcomes of a, a survey or, or a measuring tool like this. So this data that we're seeing, and if you cast your eyes to the top right hand corner of each box, we can actually start to understand that during the first wave of COVID, which was Q2 and Q3 of 2020, we actually saw the connection to the organization go up since the, the prior 12 months in 2019. We saw people being inspired by the company. Benefits changed. Managers started to connect with their organizations and give them communications on health, well-being. Um, we moved to digital, yes, but then actually we communicated way more to our employees than we had before. The support mechanisms kicked in. We started, you know, moving uh, forward and then our security total rewards piece. We started looking at the benefits and how we can still offer that fair remuneration in light of perhaps furloughs and those other things. So even though we know that the devastating impact of COVID from an organizational perspective, the impacts were positive on the individual contributor. Let's jump forward then. So now what we're looking at is that same view, but now this is that second wave of the, the pandemic. So we're looking at early Q1 2021. We've just come out of lockdown for some of us, but now we're moving back into, you know, that there's, uh, there's different variations and people have been perhaps working um, from home. Perhaps they're starting to be recalled back into the office uh, in some uh, geographies. What we're seeing is still a continued connection to the organization in pretty much all of the areas. But now when you see in the top left-hand corner, that inspiration and the true connection and the visibility on where we want to be as an organization has dropped. And you can see it's dropped by about three percentage points, which doesn't seem like a, a big number, but if you think about all the organizations that we work with and the size of them, that's actually a statistically significant drop in the inspiration. And this is where it started to go a, a little bit wrong um, for a lot of organizations globally. I'm working from home in many, in many cases. I don't haven't seen my colleagues in a long time. Um, I've started to think about, oh, this is you know a nice, but do I really have a good connection to my team and my company? I'm starting to evaluate my work based on the task orientated um, actions. Every day I'm set new tasks, every day I complete them, and I'm not seeing the wider culture of my organization. Jump forward one more step then to the full year of 2021. So that's taken another year into account and the full year of 2022. And you start to now see the decline in the employee experience. You start to see the trust in the leadership and the organization uh, start to wane. The increase isn't as much. We start to see that inclusion and diverse environment start to wane. The collaboration uh, isn't growing as much. And then my understanding of what we're trying to do and the support, which is, you know, aimed at the line manager side of things is starting to go down. I'm losing trust in my organization. I've been, you know, in this uh, situation for a long time. And now um, we're, we're starting to, to sort of come out of it, but, but not in the right way. The other way to look at this is, is what they call the great resignation. And you can see that on the right hand side, the intention to stay at organizations drop significantly during this time. Now, whether that was because people have had such good benefits in the past and now they've been asked to come back into the office, whether they've got used to that flexible working and some of those things are, are taking away, or whether it's the fact that you are evaluating your employee experience through the tasks and you're starting to think, I don't actually enjoy my job. Purely now I'm doing it on a task-based environment, I'm not really connecting with what I'm doing and I, I want to move on. We understand that there are some uh, differences, you know, in South Africa versus perhaps the rest of the world, that this may not come out in the, the, the professional stream and maybe at the, you know, uh, individual contributor level, but those uh, highly educated professionals, the, the war on talent, if you think about senior executives and the talent you have, there's starting to be a movement of people and an understanding that, you're calling me back into the office, but potentially I can get a job with this uh, international. I can work for a boss who sits in Australia and I can still sit in my 
very nice location by the by the sea by the beach as long as i have my internet connection so that's what we're starting to see uh you know or we saw from the data if i then jump ahead to 2022 what are our predictions for what's going to happen and what could be seen in organizations um it has a lot to do with the well-being element and the well-being side of things and specifically for the level of um, management at the line manager and supervisor level, what we've seen recently is a buildup of, of burnout and sort of a, a psychological frustration, I guess we'd call it, with that uh, area of, of management. And purely because these are the guys that have held the organization together throughout uh, COVID. And now what's happening is, one, they're starting to lose talent. And two, they're starting to, to be under strain in order to continue the, the business as normal that they've been asked to do throughout COVID. And so we're seeing a lot more burnout, a lot more time taken and absenteeism in this uh, population. Um, and we're, we're thinking that, you know, there was a great resignation in, in 2021. Potentially, we're talking about, you know, a, a great manager uh, resignation and or burnout for these guys and, and a lack and a drop in their capabilities in 2022. Um, so that was a brief on, on all the data. Um, um, Liesl, I, I'm not sure if you have any follow-up questions or, or anyone on the line has any comments or what they've seen in their own uh, experiences uh, throughout this time. I'm, I'm wondering, um, I'm thinking maybe we should have people chat in breakaways for a few minutes to, to just kind of go, wow, what did I hear? And, and what did that bring up for me? Um, and then we can come back and see if there's specific questions before we continue. Is that okay? I think that'd be perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put, uh, put you into some breakaway rooms. Just go and talk about what you've heard. Um, what was wow about it? What, what did you expect? Uh, what do you think about the, the, the great manager resignation <laughs> that's predicted? Um, I have to say a lot of that has come up in conversations I've heard. Um, the, the incredible impact that the managers have on employee experience, I think, has, been, has not been as much as a focus as it should be. It's become an a, a HR agenda, an HR project um, to keep employee experience high um, and positive and, and not necessarily giving the, the managers the tools and the and the ability to do it. Um, okay, so I'm going to put you into breakaways to go and have a conversation for a little while. And we're going to give it about ten minutes. Open the rooms. There you go. It looks like everybody's back. Okay, so let's get some feedback about what you were talking about. Um, anybody wants to go first or shall we ask for the different room? Who's ready to share? Okay, let's start with Christu, Danielle and Rachel. You were in a room together. What did you guys talk about? Hey, hi, Liesl, it's Rachel. Um, so I think we, we sort of um, resonate with a lot of what was shared um, in particularly, uh, or particularly myself. Um, I've seen a lot of the, the trends that you spoke about happening in our own organization. Um, and we had an interesting discussion with Chris to around organizational design and actually engaging with managers around how work should be organized. Um, to ensure that they can cope with it, um, specifically linked to that aspect of the burnout um, area that we, we spoke about in the first session. Um, so those were some of the things that stood out for us. Team, I don't know if there's anything else I forgot that you'd like to mention. Over to you. I think that's, that, Rachel, that's, that's, that's really what um, struck me when I listened to what you, you and Daniel are facing is that 
<coughs> is that is that we actually do nothing about the overwhelm that managers are experiencing. We have like when we talk about organization design, we have these large transformations, etc. They're happening all the time. But those things are just added complexity and complicatedness for managers. Uh, and we, at the same time, we throw them with all sorts of initiatives. So, so this, all of these new things they need to do, they now need to look after the wellness of the people. They need to look after the employee experience of the people. I mean, geez, poor managers, you know, employee experience, another thing on my plate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they're working in a completely different context. And, and, and it's not working because because the work has been designed for a different kind of space. It's been designed for offices. It's been designed for different patterns of contact, of interaction, et cetera. And, uh, and it's not gonna go away. So it needs to be redesigned. Um, so I'm talking almost of design at a different level, design from the bottom up is, okay, we've got the overall structure, but what are we going to do to, and, 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 and honestly, you know, we can sit here as org designers or org experienced experts or whatever we want to call ourselves, HR, OE, you name it. <laughs> we have some ideas, but we have to ask the managers what it is that's going on and what they need and how they think it should be redesigned. That's my two cents about that. We have to ask the managers. We can't just throw them with more stuff. Thanks, Christy. Um, let's hear from another room and then I'll give, um, we'll give Joe some, some time to respond to what he's heard. Uh, Lorraine, Richard and Tamlin, you guys were together. I'm happy to give some feedback. Um, so I think in our group, we said, I think we've all experienced these challenges in, in some way or form, but that it's really a great opportunity for companies to relook at the EBP. So how can we actually use this time to relook how we do things and, and make it for the better? So I know I work for a large corporate and it's very difficult to try and make those changes. Um, so whether you can do it for your own business area or if you have to wait on group, I think that's one of our biggest challenges at the moment. Um, but I, and I think a lot of our clients are like, they want to see research, what's going out there, but this is new for everybody. There isn't that concrete research of what is the right thing that works. So I think that's one of the challenges at the moment as OD consultants, HR consultants, um, to be in a position to give that evidence because it's not there yet. Mm. Yeah, and very true what you're saying. Do we, do we start where we can or do we wait for group? Mm. And, then, and then how long is that going to take? Exactly. <laughs> and then maybe just one more comment. Um, we are, we've got a range of people in our organization. So, you know, IT, super like hectic specialists and then call center as well. So you kind of, in my mind, creating this bigger divide when we're saying call center has to be back at the office every day because they've got PCs, there's ESCOM, there's this issue, there's that issue. And then those who are, you know, living in more comfortable areas and houses are working remote. So it's creating a little bit of a divide, but that's something we have to navigate as well. Mm. No, definitely. Some of our clients who's in manufacturing as well, they never, they never ever worked from home. They just right through from level five were, were at the office in different configurations in bubbles and, and so on, but they've never been, been working from home and now the, the support services don't want to come back to the office and there's some, some conflict happening there and some tension about how do you manage that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Tamlin. Um, and the last room, Guido and Marie. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to share the feedback? Uh, yeah, you go, Marie. Yeah. So we, we thought the research was interesting, um, particularly around um, where Joe presented that, you know, in the beginning, there was a greater sense of connectedness and purpose for people, <clears throat> sorry, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and 
what was fascinating to note is that generally a good crisis does that it brings people together. There is a greater sense of purpose, but that seems to have dissipated a little bit. So how do organizations sustain that um, was an interesting question. Um, then actually Greta helped me also to unpack this idea of employee experience, which in the past, you know, employee experience was about a building and your colleagues and how good the food was at the canteen and the experience was housed in a particular structure. And now people are actually at home and the, the, the task element of the job is the, the reality, right? So they don't normally have the connectedness they had in the past. And the great resignation is also partly people saying they've got time to reflect on their job and they actually really don't like it. And part of it was probably influenced by the fact that they had a container that helped them to be distracted by the core tasks of their roles. So that was interesting. And then the idea of middle managers for me, it's like, it's not even a new conversation. I think that middle managers have always been under an immense amount of pressure. And now the, the pandemic has just further exacerbated that. And it, um, some of Goddard's feedback was fascinating that I don't think they need more interventions. I think it's just the space to, to, to rethink and redesign and think about how work should be because it just feels like we just add more things to this middle manager plate, employee experience. Now they must manage the fourth industrial revolution. And now they're soon gonna operate in the metaverse. And so, and we're having conversations about mental health. But I don't think there's been anything concrete that says actually what now with this middle management layer, because this was pre-COVID and COVID and the pandemic has just further exacerbated it. And this ad of now having to do uh, employee experience might actually just set people off the edge. And so um, the, the great resignation probably would be a great reality in that middle management area. Um, and then in my view, I think there's also a great sense of empathy because this great resignation, it seems that it's not unique to an industry. It's happening with everybody. And everybody's saying, actually, instead of the war for talent, which is the words that you use, is that how do people internally think about how do they reskill? How do they start closing the gaps? How do they look for resources that are underutilized? Because the idea that after people resign, they can just force people externally, it, it probably isn't um, going to be the most effective way to do it. So I think organizations should be having the conversation around skills internally, as opposed to how they're gonna quickly close the gap when, when people do um, resign. Mm. So that was the feedback. God, if I've left anything out, you're welcome to add. No, no, I think that was, that was perfect. Cool. Fantastic. And um, yeah. and Joe, you were you were in a room with Kim and Michael. So I don't know if you want to give some feedback before you start um, responding to what you heard. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I made a few notes. Um, so yeah, we had some really really good conversations and and some very different uh, tracks in terms of of what the guys Kim and Mike were doing. Um, Kim mentioned and Kim jump in talking about how she had seen a lot of this manager burnout start to appear in her role. And actually it started way before uh, COVID, you know, uh, was, was a real big issue for her. Um, and then Mike was saying he's on this track to, to join a new organization, a more dynamic startup organization, actually in a different uh, country. And so his journey was aligned with this, you know, I, I've you know, been, been entrenched and looking for something new. And then this opportunity comes off and now I'm excited and inspired again and, and aligning with what we're trying to do. So Kim, anything further to add? No, um, I think you've sum summarized it. We can't go into details. We, we want to hear more from you, so. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, so look, let me respond to some of the comments uh, just now, um, because I, I've written a couple of things down. So uh, the first thing was, you know, managers uh, and, and employees should be able to feed back and we shouldn't be putting things on them, but they should be able to, to speak up and, and be able to actually guide us on what they need. Right. Um, this this also somewhat aligns with the comment about organizations not wanting to jump before the research is there. So what we see is a move in the industry to, to what we call continuous listening. And what it essentially does, and you may have heard this, this term thrown around, but basically what it means is you have a way or a number of ways that different populations within a company can feed back. And that feedback, the internal feedback becomes the uh, evidence for 
leaders to make changes to policies, procedures, structures, however they do it. Now, it's, it's a big jump. And it's definitely something that, you know, organizations are doing, say, more Northern uh, Europe and North Africa, sorry, and North America. Um, but it is something that's having a lot of traction because once that continuous feedback loop comes in and, you know, perhaps it's not just your annual survey, there's a couple more listening interactions and more dynamic interactions, they start to listen to it. They start to react to it. And then, in fact, they rely on that more than they do the external consultants because they're getting up to date live information continually about what their uh, workforce needs. Um, so, yeah, that, that's one thing. Um, EVP, uh, it, it was mentioned uh, and a re, uh, realizing of what the EVP is for our organizations. Again, it's such a big industry trend at the moment. We have uh, an issue here actually in the region um, in that the startup mentality, they're popping up all over the place and they're actually drawing all of the biggest talent. Um, people want to be part of this new tech age. They want to understand exactly what, uh, you know, what is it like to be part of a new startup and be part of that inspiration? The other organizations who are losing talent are suffering because traditionally they've given, you know, the benefits that you get, your, your monthly pay packet, and these other guys are offering them something new and, and exciting. And so redesigning the EVP for some of these more traditional organizations and, and actually larger international organizations, I'll give you the name of uh, uh, Saudi Aramco as one of these organizations. They're starting to redesign what they offer the training and development opportunities that they offer above and beyond what a startup potentially could, the other benefits that they are in a position financially and also from a well-being perspective to offer that perhaps a startup couldn't, to try and get back in the game, to say, yeah, look, it's exciting to be part of it, but there's a lot for you to learn in certain parts of your career to stay with us because we've defined our employee value proposition. We can give you what some of these organizations can't. And then the other way to look at that EVP piece is, you know, the transitioning of talent can go both ways. People are joining organizations and startups, but not everyone is going to align to that kind of culture, which means some of that talent will make its way back into the, uh, the larger uh, internationals and, you know, more established companies. So it's being able to understand, you know, where can we get that talent back from? The cross-industry talent. So, for example, uh, people who work in uh, healthcare traditionally with tech skills are actually moving into a different train, uh, completely different, whether you know it's telecoms or whatever it might be. So, understanding where to source that talent is also another thing on on, on uh, leadership and HR's agenda. Um, the final thing uh, before I, before I stop talking, uh, maybe get any feedback on that, uh, is the uh, the sustainable. I think we're talking about inspiration in terms of that, that, you know, how do we maintain the level of inspiration we saw during COVID? Well, what we found is, unfortunately, it is the continuation of, of banging the drum and communicating and reminding employees about how and um, what you're trying to do. There, there really is no other way to do it than keep reminding people about it. But the way you can do it can change. The digital means that you communicate with people can change and it can refresh exactly the, the vision that they have on you if you're more traditional organization. Think about some uh, tech tools like Yammer, for example, or even social media, ways that you can connect to them with your vision and mission, which is maybe slightly different from how you might have done it in the past. Because all these tools are available and they can be relatively uh, inexpensive for you, but also it redesigns yourself as a more forward thinking tech organization. It, it is a lens to take, of course, but it's one that can give you a, a boost, especially when it comes to retaining talent and keeping people inspired. Um, so I think that that's, that's kind of a brain dump of, of what I heard. Um, Lisa, anything from, from your perspective? Um, no, I, 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 I'm very much focused on the, um, on the manage, managers, you know, thinking that they, they were already burnt out and and under extreme pressure before COVID and how they must feel now. And I guess if we if we think about losing losing talent, that that layer of management is quite important. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Marie, I see you've got your hand raised. I had <clears throat> I had the same question around Joe saying um 
asking Joe, so what is his view on this middle management layer? And also what are some of the other trends that he sees emerging? Um, and I had a question specifically around this metaverse because um, it is very topical right now um, yeah. as we continue to evolve this hybrid world of work. So I had just had a question specifically on that as a trend and, and which organizations are a little bit more advanced um, in this space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let, let's, kind of dive into the, the, the metaverse thing first. Uh, so it, it's a huge uh, topic, of course, and it does stand to be a very big disruptor in, in the way that we work, especially maybe in some of the, the tech companies. Um, if I give you the example of here, which is obviously the market I know best, we have maybe five or six of the biggest telecommunications companies starting to explore what could it mean to be prominent and an active employee within the metaverse and essentially what that means is you know you log onto your computer in the morning but actually you would log on to the metaverse and start to represent your brand in this virtual space so i mean just everyone i'm sure is aware but the metaverse is essentially a virtual world where uh, everyone can go and the reason they're trying to get ahead of it is because from a brand perspective you know you, you have a high street uh, store or even you have an online store you might get some traffic but if you have a virtual reality store and it's close to where for example people log on to that world you're going to get 10 times the amount of foot traffic to your brand than you would on any high street or even website because no one has to seek you out it's there they enter the world and it's right there in front of you so yes, it, it stands to be a huge disruptor of, of, of both marketing, of both how we're employed, because there could be an expectation to actually log on to the metaverse in order to, to fulfill your employment, which is a, it's a complete revolution. What it needs then, if you think about it from, a, from an OD perspective, is a completely new uh, line of employees who are both versatile in digital uh, marketing, let's say, but then also being able to be capable of navigating that um, that that metaverse um, from a, you know a, a gamification perspective, if we want to call it that. Um, it, it does go back to my trend about sourcing talent from other industries. We are seeing that in order to fulfill some of these roles that are appearing, people are going to very interesting and unique places where they wouldn't have gone before. As I mentioned, medical here in the region is, is one of those places. Um, you know, People with technical skills uh, are just as likely to be able to handle uh, digital online worlds with some retraining as they would if we're trying to compete, for example, from an MIT candidate. Um, so we're seeing a lot of retraining going on towards that digital uh, mind space. If we come back to the manager side, and let me just answer that question very, very quickly. It, it is such a big problem because, you know, we heard from, from some of you guys, you know, it's always been the way. Managers have always been the, you know, the squish between the strategy and the everyday qualms. It's right. And then COVID brought about a, a real um, uh, amplification of some of those stresses. What we try and, and look at in terms of employee experience is not giving managers more to deal with, but giving them some data from our employee experience activities, which will actually support them doing what they do. So, for example, if we look at a, a basic uh, engagement example where you, know, you do a correlation analysis on your exit interview versus your engagement results, and you find out, for example, that one of your dimensions is, is highly correlated, let, let's take development, for example, then what you can do is relate that directly back to your line managers to say, look, we have studied throughout the life cycle of the employee. When they enter, they say this. When they do their engagement survey, they say this. And the people who have exited actually say that there's no development in this team. What we hope from that is rather than giving them something else to worry about, we go beyond that and we give them the data they need to start adapting perhaps their hiring approach, perhaps the way they communicate with employees. Um, you know, rather than that kind of here is your report, you do you do something with it, we can start giving them data to actually do something uh, meaningful and change that behavior directly, rather than, uh, you know, the, the traditional, uh, you know, here's the report, process the data and now come up with some actions, we can be more prescriptive of that, because we've already got the data, it's already under the umbrella of employee experience, we know the journey, we've mapped out our different points, and we can, you know, therefore be more more prescriptive. 
So I hope that that made some sense. I'm uh, I'm uh, sharing my mind with you as as we speak. Yeah, um, Joe, I'm excited about the next slide because I really enjoyed talking through it when we were preparing. Um, and maybe that will, will align back to some of the conversations we have and even open up more, more thinking. So, so maybe, um, and, and I'm looking at the time, we only have 30 minutes left. So, so maybe if, if you can jump into that. Yeah, of course, that, that would be absolutely fine. So look, what I wanted to do with you is, is then kind of go one step further than just some of our predictions based on, on the results. We have a high focus on, on what we would call, or big focus on what we call high performance organizations. And these are the top caliber organizations that we work with both from a engagement perspective, but also from a profitability and revenue perspective all around the world. And what we found from the research that we've done is that there are five key trends at the moment, which are important to these organizations that differentiate them between a standard organizations and those that we would consider to be high performing. The first one, I don't think is, is, is really much surprise to anyone, the adaptability to flexible working. Two kind of thought trains on this, one to continue on with the adaptable and flexible working uh, policies that were made so, uh, so available in the, the COVID, but then also to re-understand what roles actually do need to be in the office. And for those that do, is there any kind of uh, adjustments we can make to their uh, working environment in order to compensate them in some way to make sure that that inequity that they feel is not the same? Oh, this guy works from home five days a week. How comes I have to come in for five days? Is, is there anything that we can do? And it's a tough, tough uh, conversation. And it sometimes goes back to adapting our benefits. Uh, as I mentioned to, to Kim in our breakaway group, there are some organizations in London who are actually taking away the travel uh, benefit from people who are no longer traveling to London. So it's fine. You can work from you know outside of the city, but you would therefore lose the inner city uh, salary bump that you would normally get. And that's just a reality of, of where you work and how you work. It, it's tough because you take, of course, money away from people. And then that's a whole different conversation and, and can lead to, to various things. But it is opening up that conversation and that mindset. Um, the other side of that, as I mentioned, is the flexibility in line managers to, OK, you need to come into the office, but at the discretion of your line manager, you can perhaps do a morning and then you can take the afternoon off. The next day you can you know, do a full day and maybe make up at some other time or just give you the flexibility. That empowerment of that line manager, it also gives them more uh, ability to handle their own people. It takes away some of the stresses perhaps of, of what COVID has caused for them because they can actually be a bit more flexible um, in, in, their, in their teams and make their lives maybe a little bit easier. So secondly, let's, let's look at the rebalancing of the X offerings. Total rewards is coming up a lot, and that's the whole package. Um, and it's about including things like diversity and inclusion programs. It's about talking about well-being initiatives. Mental health, we're now talking about, you know, how can I connect with my employees um, from that well-being perspective? Um, what else do I do to offer employees well-being initiatives inside their current employment? For example, we are doing now in Willis Towers Watson a virtual commute to work. So you're in your house, you log on to the computer, it takes you through a journey, uh, and not necessarily a bus journey, but just a journey of what am I doing today? What are my priorities? What there's some music playing? What do I want to achieve in today's kind of um, you know uh, working environment? And then that, hopefully that gives you some idea to get you ready for your work day. And then at the end, you do 15 minutes wind down from that. What have I achieved today? How would I prepare for tomorrow? And then what do I got planned for myself this evening? It's just a 15 minute exercise, but it actually helps people to, you know, first ramp up to work in the morning and then ramp down. If you've got meetings, then sometimes, you know, you jump into them, you've dropped the kids off, you run, you know, you run home, you cook the dinner. But this actually means I start work at quarter two or quarter past and I give myself time to do this virtual going to work. That and other well-being initiatives are coming in aimed at this, this uh, virtual and long distance um, new reality of work. 
The third one is something which is very close uh, to my heart and also is, is answering some of this uh, manager questions. Leading change with compassion. What we have seen uh, in the, the well-being space is actually compassion and what they're calling empathetic attunement. Uh, being, uh, and I hate it, it's very consultative, but essentially what it is, is the ability to voluntarily join another person's mess is, is how I would describe it. As an EX leader and as a HR leader, putting yourself in the shoes of the person you're dealing with, but also if we're EX professionals, putting yourself in the, the shoes of the manager and the management and what they have to do in their role. When I, when I talk to um, clients about the EX role, I'm always saying you have to then put yourselves as a consultant to the business. Try and separate yourself as hard as it is and, and very, you know, be very clear that now, now I'm consulting the business, I'm putting myself in your shoes and I'm trying to lead with some compassion and empathy. Part of that is the transparency of the role. Um, Post-pandemic has become very important. People wanting co to connect with leaders and also have that more uh, empathetic leader in the conversations they're having. Um, reconnecting with employees, I mentioned continuous listening. Um, what we're seeing is that there are various touch points in the uh, employee experience. Having the right listening strategy is very important. When you think about, uh, and let me just very quickly to, to show you the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here. I'm just going to jump on a second. This is kind of what we see as the employee life cycle. These are most of the areas that we can start to influence the employee experience. As I said, in the top left-hand corner, before you even join the organization, recruitment, onboarding, the ongoing engagement, all the way through to being an alumni of that organization and having an alumni community, we can influence each and every step by listening, by changing some of the, the uh, policies around those elements, and then feeding back to maybe the management or even OD or whoever it might be about that. And then this is kind of some of the broader ways that we can start listening. My point on this is there is so many unique ways. Getting that right is extremely important. And the, the job of really a consultant or a, an EX professional is understanding the organization and understanding at what point you want to listen and or uh, let's call it speak and give your best practice onto the organization and getting that right is is, is somewhat of, of an art form but it's actually it's not very hard to start that process just by mapping out your employee experience in your organization understanding what data points you have from each of them and then starting to see how you could either gather more or start uh, consulting to the business the, the the trick is the mindset of that individual to be like this is my remit now I went from focusing on onboarding to doing an engagement survey to now this is my remit. And, and that is going to be one of the biggest challenges for, for modern EX professionals is, is compassing. I'm now sort of responsible for, for gathering data on all of this um, and using some of these technology based ways to do it. Um, let me just jump back then because it, it links to my previous point, um, building that integrated strategy, but using technology to your advantage. There are so many cost-effective tools to, to both listen and um, you know, communicate with your employees. It would only take a Google search for most of you to find perhaps a free tool like a, like a Yammer or something like this, or even a breakout group as we're having here to be able to start collecting data on your employee experience. It would only take you, you know, to be a little bit interested and, and, and you know, reach out to your even Google, but also maybe uh, us as Willis Towers Watson to find out how you can start listening and, and building that strategy. So again, I, I feel like I always talk too much and go into too much detail. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lisa, or comments from anyone, please uh, uh, challenge me on this. Uh, ask me any questions. I don't think you've been speaking too much at all, Joe. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, so I want, I want feedback, like you said. Anybody who wants to challenge Joe or have a question or just um, have a comment on anything that came up, Tamlin. So, yeah, I think just everything Joe's been saying is, is sparking things in my mind. And 
we do so many surveys as a business. And I think that is kind of the never ending thing where it's survey fatigue and we've got this going on and that going on and we want to get more impact from employees and then nothing happens and then employees don't respond. So yeah, I don't know what thoughts are on that. Like how, how do we use the tools or do these things to get the feedback, but then employees are either too busy or just not going to give the feedback I, I don't know what if other people have done things that have might have worked or, or not i'd be interested to hear from everyone um i, I do have some comments as well so anyone wants to, to give their thoughts yeah i i absolutely agree because i think organized employees are a little bit fatigued by focus groups and another survey and something that comes from group and and so I, I'm just wondering how leaders will really get the information that, that they need in a way that employees are actually open to the engagement. That's one. And then the second part in my view is that I don't, I, I think organizations already have a lot of data. Like there are so many touch points where they can already draw on without having to de redesign another um, survey or I use another tool. So sometimes it's just being awake to what exists currently. Let's start with what we have when we recruited people, when people were exiting in the daily course of business. So in my mind, sometimes it's about collating what already exists as opposed to continuously trying to redesign these listening tools. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Um, just a short one. I think reciprocation is important if, um, and action. Uh, so you got all this data, all these surveys, and then uh, there's no real action. And I think that's important where for us internally in our little group where we've uh, shared, been transparent about results, not aggregating them too much, shared almost everything. Uh, the response has gotten better where stuff gets uh, aggregated too much and there's no real action. Uh, I think that's where the employee uh, engagement, I think, stops. I think people, people will engage again if it has meaning. If it's not, it doesn't, if it's not, if it doesn't make sense to them, they'll stop engaging. And there are reasons why it doesn't make sense to them. It's because there's a lot of the time, no real action. I agree with Guido completely. It's, um, it's not really a fatigue. It's just a, um, a resistance. It's real resistance to doing another survey or another focus group because, you know, what happened before. Um, it's almost like a, yeah, it's a, it's a fatigue with going through the process again when they're not seeing the benefits of that time invested. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, I am completely uh, aligned with with that, and that was going to be my response. I, having run potentially over 150 engagement surveys with varying different organizations around the world, um, the transparency first and foremost on the results of, of, of a listening, but then also the action that you have or have not taken is, is vitally important. If I've run a survey every year, but not a single action has been, been taken or whether it's been taken, but here's the point, not communicated back to employees for them to make the link to the action and, and the listening thing, then that cycle is repeatedly uh, you know, downtrodden and becomes less valuable. And I see this engagement survey come across my desk and I think, what is the point? Honestly, I, I haven't seen a, a single thing come of it. So then if you're in that position of survey fatigue, my advice to you would be go back to whatever the most recent listening activity you did is, get that data. And firstly, if you haven't communicated, I don't think it really matters how long ago it was, find some way to put that into a, an all staff communication and then take some action. Now, it doesn't have to be a big bang action. It doesn't have to be expensive. But what it has to be is we have listened to you and we are able to make some form of change based on that. And it could be something simple, something around communication, uh, whatever it is, even if, and, and this I know some may say is, is maybe cheating, even if you link it to an initiative that you're currently doing, as long as it's aligned, start making the link between feedback and action.
Yeah, uh, it's not. It's also, you know, not cheating to remind people of the actions you've already taken um, before you would go into a new listening cycle. Um, you know, some people steer away from that. They say, you know, we don't want to prime results, but you're, you're priming feedback. You're saying, look, you said last time we've done this time. Um, and so that's that's a perfect communication strategy to um, to do. The other side of that discussion is your leadership. So we do see a lot of these uh, things fail due to lack of leadership buy in or, or that same pessimism about, you know, I've seen these engagement survey results before. Nothing's coming from this data. Sometimes it takes a refresh of that program to be able to, to do something. But again, sometimes these same uh, actions can be impactful. What I would recommend, and it's difficult because you know it's completely different in, in lots of different um, organizations, is that you, you would hold a session with your leadership to show the value of the listening program and what it has done for your organization. And then if it hasn't done anything yet, then go back to taking the action and then going back to, to show them this is the action that we've taken and these are the direct um, feedback we get. Um, what we've tried to do, there's an organization here, uh, there's a hospital in, in Dubai and they have this exact same fatigue. And they came to us from a different supplier and said, look, we're gonna try one more engagement survey for us. It's it's break on it's make it or break. We're we're probably just going to do some some something else to, to get our KPIs. And um, we started with leadership. We took the the idea of we're using your existing data to just start out with a, an action. Then we took the process from action to survey, and then back to action, and then started to build up the uh, the process again from the ground up. So yeah, don't be afraid to, to start looking into what you can do before you, you start listening again, if you're at that survey fatigue uh, position. Okay, a any other thoughts on, on any of this? Um, if I may, you mentioned something about empowerment of the, the line manager um, and the challenge that we have, I also work for a very big, organization and we are sort of a, a sub of a of a group and these big ships take very long to to turn and what we often find is that if we do try and say okay what can we do now while we're waiting is that we sort of get halfway through what we're trying to do and then the group will come and sort of on a completely different course and then our employees are like what's going on and also you know in in empowering managers in in the south african context which is so focused on rightfully so fairness and consistency amongst employees uh you know if if my manager say is you know open to let's talk about mornings or afternoons or you work from home you don't that actually sometimes opens a very big problem for us if the experience amongst employees especially at lower levels is not consistent then we yeah. sit with uh, employee relation type issues yeah, that's a very in interesting uh, problems. Uh, the the answer to to the first one potentially, uh, Danielle, depending on you know, how sensitive the changes you're trying to make is is some form of of openness with your leaders to say, look, we have these initiatives. They are going up through the organisation, but you know it, it is part of a big bigger ship, and we are trying and we are working on your behalf. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can. Um, you know, there's no real other way to, to frame the question. And then, mm. of course, just keep pushing up. I, I feel that pain. I'm part of a huge organization of 50,000 globally. Um, getting anything done from a, from a yeah, perspective like that, it, it can be like a, a blood and getting out of stone. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, openness, uh, I think, as much as you can, depending on the sensitivity, um, would be a good place to start because there's no reason you can't be open about the things you're trying to do for them uh, to get yeah. them on your team and give them maybe a little bit of time. The, mm -hmm. the other thing is, is of course, uh, extremely sensitive, and especially when it comes to, you know, uh, any kind of legal ramifications and or, or anything else with different maybe worker groups. Um, I've worked extensively in Germany, uh, where of course they have very very strict workers unions and and the, and the rest, um, they've had extreme problems uh, throughout COVID for that very reason. So it, it has to be done quite sensitively, 
um, and then sometimes you know it doesn't go your way and you need to apply that everyone works from the office to all populations and, and I think then you know you need to be open to to stating maybe some of the reasons for that and then if there is sort of any flexibility that you can give uh, line managers in terms of their individuals and I'm not talking about you know one manager does this one manager does that but an organization here a property organization they literally gave their line manager the ability to shorten and lengthen the day by, by 30 minutes. And it actually worked quite well because there was perceived flexibility from the manager population and there was perceived flexibility from the employees. And it was a tiny incremental change, but it did have a big impact. And that's going to obviously be a negotiation under the legal ramifications and the, mm. the politics of the groups that you're dealing with. Um, but yeah, small changes to that you can build on. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if that helped. It does. <laughs> Anything else from anyone? <clears throat> Joe, <clears throat> what are some of the creative ways that you've observed that uh, organizations are dealing with the skills gap um, as people resign, but also as more roles become available, what are some of the things you've seen in terms of learning academies? Because um, earlier you spoke about, you know, organization employees having the opportunity to grow horizontally because that those vertical structures are, are changing so frequently. Can you just share some of the trends um, in terms of the skills and, and how other organizations are doing it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'll give you a, a real example. Um, we, there's an organization in, in the Middle East, it's called Etislat. You may be aware of it. It's a huge telco. Um, they have the Etislat Academy. What, what, what they're trying to do um, is reinvent job roles and job descriptions of some of their long tenured employees to include some digital uh, competencies and or responsibilities. Sometimes they're not large role changes. Sometimes it's something very, very simple. But in order to get them on the journey of growing with the organization, growing with the digital uh, new trend of world, and then broaden their horizons in terms of what they will be able to do in the future, right? Because once you start putting some digital ideas to, to a job role, uh, it, it becomes a, a lot more, more you know, interesting. Um, it, it is then tough if you if you look at you know your traditional I guess let's say job spec about you know how do I horizontally move uh, employees. Um, it, it's a con conversation we're continually having, especially with the, the flatter organisations. Um, SMEs is is another way to do it um, for onboarding. So if you have some some SME type roles, you can create where you pose that person as the expert in their field because they have a long tenure. They have a lot of experience under their belt and you give them some time, if you can, off of their normal working day to fulfill an SME role, um, especially if they have a long tenure. Usually they're looking to perhaps impart some of their skills on a younger, newer workforce. And that SME role fits in nicely with what they're trying to achieve, perhaps before the end of their career, or perhaps they, they find they want to grow and become more of a teacher. Uh, I can't think of anything else uh, apart from aligning with digital. Um, but yeah, if, if we go then to the outside job market and, 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 and attracting that talent, uh, there are a couple of interesting tools that some organizations are using uh, in order to reimagine some of their new roles. So for example, when you fulfill a role, you have a traditional job spec, of course, and you have a role to fill, you actually redesign that role based on the future need of the organization. And it's part of that uh, future 2.0 um, by using, this is a pretty cool piece of technology. It crowdsources what are some of the most desired roles on the, uh, the internet. And I will share some of this uh, intellectual capital with, uh, with Lysel. And essentially it crowdsources what are some of the most prevalent roles on LinkedIn and, and all those other job sites. And then it tells you what are some of the skills being marketed under those roles. 
And by crowdsourcing it, you are understanding what some of the biggest hirers around the world and around the region are looking for in terms of their skills. So therefore, you identify the newest job roles based on those skills rather than based on the traditional job spec that you're looking for. So you are future proofing some of your roles um, into the future. It's, it's not a very uh, costly piece of software. Um, if, I, if I try and be a bit consultative there. Um, but yeah, that, that's something some organizations are doing. I hope that last part made sense. No, it does. The reason I say that, because if I look at in the SA context, some of the conversations I'm having with colleagues and businesses in, in L&D is how do they actually do away with saying what role do we need, but rather what skills do we require yeah. for this business to move forward? Yep. And, and actually saying, let's, let's park the idea of roles because they are so binary and then just outsource even when necessary with the skills that we need. Um, and hence I'm asking, how do, how do you solve for the skills question? Because it, it is a big gap, particularly the analytical skills and the data skills that you made mention of. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we're finding that that cross-industry sourcing is something that's becoming very prevalent, um, taking your uh, talent from, from a place that you wouldn't traditionally take your, your talent from um, when you're actively trying to recruit from, from others. Um, but yeah, skills-based job roles and, and also having more flexibility in the job description to say, we're hiring you on this job description and you know we're not going to increase your work but you have a dynamic role whether that comes in the form of a, a contractor or whether it comes in the form of someone that you know revises their job description after a year based on the the new technology requirements for example um it, it's some interesting things that, that people are doing um yeah I, I don't have any other specific things to share about the that but what I would like to do, I'll get some information on this piece of technology, this crowdsourcing uh, technology that uh, Willis Towers Watson have partnered with, because honestly, it blew me away when I first saw it, because it actually it, it analyzes the market. And as I said, it, it's not very expensive at all. It's called Job Obble. Um, and it was designed by a guy in Hong Kong. And, and essentially what it does is he has the ability using algorithms, don't ask me what they are, to search all of the recruitment sites for skills specifically. So then he can build up an idea of what are some of the most desired skills based on the amount that they're appearing on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. And he can already see if there's going to be a war on talent in six months, these are the skills that are going to be poached, or these are the skills that are currently in the market in order for us to understand, uh, okay, where do we need to hire, maybe even pay more because there's a, a lower amount of talent available um, from a recruitment perspective and also a job spec perspective. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't do that part any any dignity, but I will share some information that the Lizelle can share with you, which will give you some some insights in that cool space that technology is going in terms of defining your roles. Thank you, Joe. Okay. So we have five minutes left, unless somebody has an urgent question. Possibly. Okay. Joe, I'm going to ask you to end us off with what, what has been in your role in the past, let's call it a year or so, what's been the, the, the main takeaways for you? What are the, what is, what is the big topics and the main takeaways and the biggest learning that's, that's happened to you in your role? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, if, if I think back across you know, all, all the clients that, that, that we've worked with, um, this need to better understand uh, our internal and external customers is, is probably something that has, has jumped out to me. And when I say internal customers, you know, I, I also mean employees and our, and our stakeholders. Um, employee value proposition connected to that because you're understanding how you frame yourself one in terms of the market one in terms of your internal customers but two who are we as an organization coming out of covid we've adapted to digital working perhaps we've changed our strategy in light of you know harsher uh, work environments maybe we've gone more digital maybe we need to go more digital but that re you know revitalizing of who we are as an organization um, it has really been a, a big thing for uh, from what I've seen. 
Um, and if we think about the HR space, which is of course where, where our, my expertise would lie, um, it's being able to justly understand who you are, what you offer, to be able to attract the right talent and retain the right talent. And sometimes that, that's, a, that's a tough conversation for people to have with them, uh, with themselves, especially from an organizational perspective, because they realize maybe how far from uh, you know, where they want to be they actually are. Um, yeah, so that's definitely one side. The other side of things is this explosion of, of well-being and, and to link to that DE and I. So it's, it's a common topic. It's coming up uh, you know, all, all over the world. Well-being from a COVID perspective, but merging more now into mental health. DE and I from a regulative, regulatory perspective in terms of you know, there are things coming in which are you know, uh, pushing organizations to, to change the way they think about their employees, but also the, the business impacts that looking at DE and I can have. So we're seeing a lot of link between the, the financial and the, the you know, diverse working environment, um, diverse uh, you know, understanding of who you are, who your people are, not just in terms of you know, genders or sexuality, but also in your age diversity, also in your mindset diversity. You know, who are you and what, what are you trying to achieve? So yeah, I, I would probably say that that is the other side of things. Well-being and DNI really having an impact on business, a tangible impact on business um, all, all around the world. Joe, um, Kim's asking, what is DNI? Oh, DNI um, and and I, I attended a webinar last week about the the trends in the L and D space. Yeah. And I talked about the the acronym Jedi. Jedi, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so Jedi is justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Yes. And I guess yours just hasn't got the J in it. Yeah. So for okay. we we look at it from uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective, right. with, with equ equity being the the important thing. Um, I, I do have some other s uh, slides to share on that for for everyone who. Uh, who is interested, maybe we can share this afterwards. I know we're out of time now, um, but the, it's just to, to frame it, the external pressures on employers to be diverse, um, but then from the other side of the, the coin, you, you know, we can no longer do nothing because there are expectations of us as an organization to, to have these themes, of course, running and, and from, from all the right reasons. But then, uh, you know, what does it mean? But then the, the, the business impacts of it, and because some of these um, policy uh, ideas are going across and that people are organizations now being forced to think about it, actually there seems some benefits. And so if you started then from the benefits with your uh, leadership, even if it's not on the agenda or being forced by policy by the local government, we're actually seeing there are some financial reasons to get involved, um, including profitability, um, revenue increases, uh, et cetera, et cetera, based on uh, diverse organizations. So the evidence is coming for, for this uh, line of thought. And, and definitely in the conversations I've been involved in, in, in whether it's the training or the L&D space, uh, coaching, consulting, leadership development, uh, conversations with, with your colleague, Matt, as well, it's DNI has to sit in everything. It has to be part of everything. It's it's not an option anymore. Yeah. Whatever the acronym is that you want to use. <laughs> yeah. No. No. That's right. That's right. It's really becoming part of the the strategy, and it goes towards this inspiration. Uh, who do I want to work for? Um, and are they equitable? And do they give fair fair chances to to all of our employees, no matter where they are? Yeah. Well, that has brought us to the end of of our time. Um, thank you so much, Joe. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, I loved it. I'm, I'm seeing nice feedback on the chat there as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing so openly. Um, thank you for your insights. Um, and uh, I hope we can get you back in a, in a few months to see what, what, what of those trends and those predictions are, are, um, are coming true and what's happening. Thank you very much. All right, it was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Lovely to speak with all of you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you for arranging bye. this, Lethal. <laughs>